Hey guys, it's Julesy, and I'm finally getting around to doing my review of the season four of Orange is the New Black. There is so much pressure. I'm looking crazy right now because I started flat ironing my <laughs> hair, but then I realized, oh my gosh, I gotta get this review done before BET Awards, and like all this stuff is happening, and I'm like trying to keep up, girl. I was in a car accident on Thursday, so I just gotta get my life together, like I've been saying for like the past 30 years of my life. And yesterday, I put up the video that I thought the least about simply to get that best fee sponsorship out of the way and I did a reaction video at the 11th hour literally to Kanye West famous and it's like now at 300k views in less than a day and I just feel really sad at how celebrity and negativity just is what people tap into and all the silly foolish teenagers and people that are in my comment section talk about why can't you do a reaction video like the fine brothers where you come from just go back there anywho you know I been said, we're not really trying to get a larger audience, we're just trying to connect more with the smart brown girls and those who are down for the smart brown girl movement. Y'all mean, y'all really need to do all that extra ish. Look at my hair looking crazy. Where did it begin with season four of Orange is the New Black? I marathoned through this whole season on Monday. So, y'all mean, thumbs up that video if you haven't already. You already know the drill, sis. Come on, oh, and you see this? This is not a smart brown girl, regular t-shirt. <sighs> I'm fat, just wait. It's a crop top. This is what the white looks like. It's almost, the black is always sold out, but I actually should have a few in stock this week. So if you see it, grab it, girl, because it'll be gone. But the white one is always in stock, and I have a coupon code for 15% either of them down below. To get back to this review, after a melodramatic season three, I was not expecting season four to come back with such a bang. But consider the time, consider the year, consider the week. Like, consider yesterday, Friday, Thursday, Brexit. Every day this year feels like too damn much and Orange is the New Black rolled all those feelings into the last four episodes of this season. Some have called it trauma porn with the blatant focus on Black Lives Matter, systematic racism, white patriarchy and oppression. Count how many times I say oppression in this review. Transphobia, the oppressive, okay, it's kind of like oppression. The oppressive structure and degradation of the human rights in the US for-profit prison system. And the Islamophobia, the Islamophobia, the Islamophobia that is scantily discussed in the reviews. Orange is a New Black altogether went for the jugular of the oppression awards and gave us no break from all the times we've said this year. Is this really 2016 and not 1952? Like seriously, that's why. Like Lali, did, we wasn't trying to go back in time though. We wasn't. This is not a review suggesting that I am the authority or that I have the absolute right opinion on Orange is the New Black. I just speak with confidence because if I don't believe in myself, who will? I am critiquing based on my preview. I understand that I am a heterosexual, cisgender, sometimes Christian, I mean casual Christian. I identify with the Christianity, the belief systems of Christians. Black woman. When we watch characters that we see ourselves in, we take it very personally because we want their storyline to go in ways that we explicitly approve of. Like that's me, I get to tell my own narrative. You can't tell my neck, I need it to go like this because I would never do that. I we are not monolithic and each character, no matter how much we believe they individually represent us. They're really an amalgamation of the diversity that exists within our subgroups. I have heard it as a critique, and I'm open to hearing more discussion on this, that the characters are drawn very broadly. Um, overall, you know, we're already, I'm already thinking, are you already thinking? Because this is meant to be a thought-provoking review. Please agree or disagree freely and respectfully. Many themes were highlighted in this season. One is that even the oppressed, can be oppressive and active members in keeping together a system of oppression. Three, four, five, oppression, oppression, oppression. Or how easy and mindlessly that one can invoke privilege, often white privilege, via apathy, becoming the main pillars of said oppression. They delved into Black Lives Matter and respectability politics, the facade of liberal ideas in the contrasting relationship of Yoga Jones and Judy King, which was one of my favorite kind of aspects of this season. Race relations in the Latino community and plenty of white fragility was presented almost to the point of exhaustion. Like, don't nobody like Piper Girl. Nobody. What I always remember is that everyone who watches is not woke and some themes that felt exhausting, like they were beating over your head, leaving you bone weary, were for the audience 
who's never had to see the world outside of themselves, as in white people who tuned into this because it's a comedy series. And some of y'all unwoke cousins, because you know, just because we brown don't mean we all get it. Character arcs that I most enjoyed this season were Lolly and her battle with schizophrenia. Suzanne, formerly known as Crazy Eyes, always has a special place in my heart because Uso Aduba, girl. Her whole storyline this season, Brian Ugly cried that deeply in I don't know how long it's been. And of course, Puse, who just, yeah, I mean, just had my heart, girl. It's gone. The actress who played the young Lolly was actually different from the actress who actually plays Lolly. Lolly really humanized the struggle of dealing with mental illness and how society viewing someone as simply crazy kind of removes their right to ever live a truly fulfilling life. Did she really end up in jail on the other side of the country because Litchfield is in Connecticut and we see her getting stopped by the cops in gentrified Seattle, Washington, I believe it was, for resisting arrests over what was she being arrested for? It's, I mean, and it's like the same thing with Crazy Eyes, which I was, I just, I just wasn't totally prepared for. Like I said, me, I mean, that, that ugly cry came out deep from like down below the sternum, girl, like the stomach. It might have been in my pancreas. How she ended up in jail was such an unnecessary situation. I have so many questions about why her sister didn't hire someone to look after her for the weekend, like a caretaker, or have her stay with someone else, or even get a coworker from her job to stay with her, to check, like, provide, if the girl's never been at 27, 28 alone before, why leave her alone like that for a weekend vacation? Like, it's easy to find somebody. Oh, that was so maddening. And I knew when she showed up at the park and saw that little boy that she recognized the grocery store, I already knew it was headed, but how quickly it escalated entirely caught me off guard. Like, I just was, I, bruh. I hope that you already knew it was gonna be spoilers. I didn't say this at the beginning, but you know, my smart brown girls got common sense. I was absolutely, positively 150, maybe a thousand plus billion percent annoyed by every last white character on this show. Piper is absolutely insufferable. Not a single white character stood up aside from Sister Ingalls going into solitary and Danny Pearson fighting to get Sophia out of solitary confinement, but every other white person this entire season stood idly aside as Piper spurred a white power Aryan gang to protect her business interests as correction officers employed the broken windows theory to traumatically damning results the Latinas and black women and you I do Ooh, we got we to talk about Latinas a little bit later on, but the, in general, the Latinas and black women were not inherently violent until Piper's racist gang began to wreak havoc on the minimal livelihood they held on to in the prison. It was the white women who caused the disruption that they were then allowed to police and then creating a cycle of violence that sat squarely on the foundation of white privilege. Captain Piscatella? So I get why they initially presented him as stern and sort of kind of affable. This is billed as a comedy series. And at the beginning, I kept waiting for a comedic break. That just never happened with Duke. Like, I didn't find none of his shenanigans funny. He could be a bear, a bottom, a top, a tray. All of the corrections officers, we see an exertion of male and white male privilege. Even a fine ass black boy, I want to say white boy girl, no. The fine ass black man that was teaching them how to do slave labor, too fine. Participating in such grotesque actions, that hurt me. They were just exerting their privilege in the most grotesque forms as one guard forces Maritza to literally eat a live mouse that I just, I, <laughs> And then the haphazard apology from the corrections officer to Pensatucky. That child is just so sorely in need of love, even from her rapist. It was very uncomfortable to watch Pensatucky endear herself to Coates, the corrections officer who raped her, and then apologize. What I questioned is how far off is this from the discussion around like Ray and Janae Rice, domestic abuse and rape victims' right to forgive and just exist. Is there a larger conversation or do I have the right to just be infuriated with Pensatucky's character arc and another corrections officer not receiving any sort of punishment for his inhumane actions? So to get back to the ancientness of the white peoples this season, Yoga Joe, sis, I was so disgusted but just 
so happy that her character highlighted the utter BS of liberal white people but who could speak on but never act on dismantling systems of oppression. Yoga Jones was the perfect subtly elitist and racist liberal like a status quo. It was a great parallel to see the easy to despise Judy King how a la Paula Deen in the Flesh Girl. She had that damn pat. Highlight Yoga Jones on shortcoming. Being a mirror image of Paula Deen who thought throwing money or throwing around the money that she has given to certain charities at folks would make people look past her blatant bigotry. For all her seeming to turn a tide as she pantomimed through a relationship with Black Cindy, she did what every other white person did, just a little bit more in your face, when she had the explicit ability to change the tide and, and advocate for the rights of pussy. King did nothing. Low key, King's character says a lot about our own inaction when we have a chance to stand for something, but it requires self-sacrifice. And we quickly turn inward in the same name of self-preservation. Caputo frustrated the entire life for the entire generation of black women that I come from. Out of me. All of them. I really just wanted him to like wake up. How hard is it to understand the weight of the injustices happening to your inmates? And the one moment he had. He used it to defend his own correction officer with no mention of any inmate, even as Pusey's body still lay cold on the ground. It was exacerbating watching these characters invoke their privilege to just check out, go home, walk through the war zone only crying about their own. The black women. They're just... Black Cindy is just absolutely quizzical. She converted to Judaism last season. I actually enjoyed seeing her awakening and kind of freedom in that sort of expression that she had with this and the joy that she found in it overall. Her Israel versus Palestine beef with Allison hard to stomach. Like I was just like sis. That a black woman would freely express Zionism and xenophobia as humor. And she kept spewing damning rhetoric and to say that black people can be racist then highlight all the reasons that we are not because racism requires power. We could be prejudiced. We could be ethnocentric. Racist girl. Like come on sis. Come on. I have definitely encountered women like her in my own comment section. It's like, it's like outside of this conversation, I would really like you. But within this conversation, I cannot morally fuck with you. I do not do respectability politics and not with Cindy 150% all the way. I don't know why they had Allison show her red locks at the end, or Kool-Aid red locks, at the end of the season. It's like, okay, since we get you must be a Philly Muslim. Cliche, cliche, cliche. I read the critique that's going around about it being trauma porn. I'll actually link it down below so you can read it for yourselves. And it kind of called the show out saying that the black women were never allowed to experience joy or black love was never existed, suggesting that the black women were reduced to the mammy trope. That's definitely a worthwhile critique though. I, I didn't walk away feeling that way. Tasty is smart. <laughs> She's very smart. Watching her as Caputo's assistant was hilarious but sad. And Danielle Brooks just acted her butt off as Tasty this season. She did an amazing job. She's definitely a protector, especially over Suzanne. And we walk through with her relationship with Puse, either season two or was it last season. In that relationship, she asserted that she had no interest in a sexual relationship with another woman. And maybe I could own it that it's my own bias or my own perception or lens as a heterosexual woman that I just didn't miss that there were no black on black love. For me though, it's because a lot of the sexual relationships were just based on negativity. Not that I have an issue with lesbianism or two black women loving each other. I think that's a very beautiful thing. When they show the white inmates paired together for intimate relationships, they didn't seem positive to me. Desirable or a relationship, just even on an emotional basis that I would wanna be in the closest to an emotionally fulfilling relationship that I saw was Puse and Sosa. All the other relationships were manipulative, one-sided, or just revolved around drugs and deep negativity. To not see any of the black women 
inmates participate in that with each other just read to me like they were above that. So it wasn't that I didn't see, I saw them as better than that because they were heterosexual. I saw them as better as that because they didn't need it to find some sort of happiness or hope to push through within the prison system to allowing someone to misuse their body. Does that make sense? I acknowledge that I do have to stop and think about why none of them were shown as being in loving relationships outside of prison in their flashbacks. You know, the one hint at Puse's girlfriends when she was in what, was she in Amsterdam or Paris, when she was in Europe, was very volatile as their families didn't accept them. You know, I, I'm not a Latina. Um, so while I enjoy the development of the characters and the dialogue around just the insidious xenophobia and racism that exists in that community. I love the humor that was used to highlight that absurdity, the xenophobia that Dominicans have towards Haitians, but the Latina characters definitely all played into the trope of being subservient and hot in the bedroom, women to their men. So like Blanca, and then she's going hard with the, of all people, the lawn care guy in the old lady's bedroom. It just, I, I mean, I thought it was funny and humorous, but it also very heavy handedly stereotypical. Finally getting to a Pusey's death, which is what I believe took everybody out. And I still don't know that I've processed it. It was absolutely heart wrenching and infuriating on a deep soul level. And I don't even think personal encapsulates how much that hurt. But I think that's why they chose Pusey to kill off. I'm kind of interested in who else could they have chosen and it not be as upsetting. I don't know, was she the most acceptable type of queer? Is that what everyone's holding on to? We could say we're sad about Freddie Gray. Trayvon, Michael and Eric, you know, we can retweet a link about Renisha Rickbry. We can share in remembrance of Sandra Bland. In all honesty, how often are we moved to invested action? You know, in these instances, action really is motivated by anger. And do we en masse really ever gotten there? There is always a disconnect because these people are not directly tied to us. I felt real true pain over Sandra Bland, but it was absolutely not the same pain that I feel when somebody that is within my intimate social circle passes away. But the death of Puse definitely kind of meets me there a, a lot closer. And that's why we are so disgusted and wanna discuss and watch and have group me chats about it, but we don't really do the same for pe other people in real life that we've heard about in the media. Puse being presented as a respectable, bougie, black person. To me showed that respectability politics just won't save you. It literally saves no one except for maybe OJ Simpson who then just uses black women that he never loved in the first place to get him free, whatever girl, another day. But the prison's PR guy hastily notes that Puse was picked up for having a blunt. And so maybe I was thinking with that, that next season, the mechanics that landed her in jail for at least a year will be shown as like a nod to the Khalif Browder situation. Being a presentable, educated black person won't save you in a world that views your melanin as a basis for your criminality. Baxter's backstory was absolutely unnecessary. It wasn't necessary for us, for black people, for woke people, for black women who understand the weight of intersectionality and the various forms of oppression that attempt to keep us pinned down. I think it was built in for all the others who say the police officer made a snap judgment with no time to spare. Zimmerman feared for his life. Oh, look at the Olympic trainer. What a charming young white man Brock Turner is. We, we so often are so used to talking to ourselves. You know, the age of social media where we can create very insular groups and where we can keep discussions about political things amongst the choir, in essence, or just in the clapback tray when we are talking to outsiders. It's never really conversations about education. It is kind of just like clap back and ad hominems nowadays. That's who I'm thinking the Baxter backstory or narrative. It was meant to be endearing to those type of people and white people and then show them how shifting the focus of Puse's murder onto how Baxter needs to be saved is further suffocating an already dead body. Maybe, and maybe I'm giving them too much credence and too much strategic thought. This is a way to get across 
to the people that aren't in my choir the necessity of Black Lives Matter, the necessity of what we are talking about when we address intersectionality as black women, when we talk about the prison system and just the unforgivable violence that happens and the traumatic experience that these women are go th going through. You know, I also thought about why, when you start going to the flashbacks of these women, do they really deserve these long prison sentences? I think America has some of the longest, unnecessarily long prison sentences for non-violent crimes. And, you know, you start to like these characters or become endeared to them or think they're not that harmless or they're not these bad people. And we don't even, we don't give this credence at all to inmates and we absolutely do not give it to black and brown women who go through the prison system. We are especially poor women. You know, to address these hard hitting topics as tired and exhausted as we are, are necessary because we're tired and exhausted because it's not getting through. And I think we are in an age of social media. We are so used to talking in 140 characters and needing to punch the snarkiest, wittiest clap back in those characters that we are literally talking in punches and nobody's gonna sit and take punches. We all end up walking away and the ability to really educate people is so often lost in our snarky, witty anger. Um, you know, my criticism overall on Pussy's death is because other than keeping her alive, I don't know what resolve or how to resolve the pain. Biggest question is why did they have to phrase it as Baxter doing it as an accident? Even in that accident, is it truly an, abs an accident or absent-mindedness? But is that absent-mindedness not there because she is just nothing more than a black inmate to you. And I don't feel like that was clearly illustrated. I felt like that was very broad and it allowed too much room for people to really sympathize with him as somebody who just did it by mistake. I don't believe that in these situations where we've seen police murder or kidnap or brutalize black and brown bodies, that it was always done with a villainous Ramsey from Game of Thrones-esque intent. It might be a lot more, I mean, did you watch OJ's 30 for 30 and almost wanna like Mark Furman? Like, I feel like it can be that affable in approach, but it is still just as damning and racist and harmful as if they went about it in a Piscatella manner. This is how deeply racism is ingrained into our society, that it can even come across as like an accident thing that just happened you know and I can read into that but I don't know that the way it was illustrated in the show was specific enough was all the white characters in action was like literally like how the whole world <laughs> I feel like is acting Maritza and Marisol crassly joking about it felt like the trolls that you find in any comment section on any social media Judy King not speaking out about it is like every youtuber with a large platform <laughs> How you do? And Caputo doing nothing more than any district attorney would do in real life. But when I criticize, I'm always left with, well, what do I suggest be the right way? I'm just at a loss for this because this is really how it's going now in 2016. I would love to hear your input. And I definitely hope in the next season that they diversify their writer's room and their production team because as great as it is to see a diverse cast, I think people could be more forgiving of the show or willing to understand more of the show's premise if the writers and directors were not so damn white. It's a little hard to understand the things you don't like about your story being told when it's absolutely not told by somebody in your group. So I understand over and over and over again that feeling. But it's such an accurate summation by Brenda Nasser. She put up on Facebook. I don't know if I'm butchering up her last name. There's a picture of it right here. But she said, the next time you try to undermine the value of social media content writers, realize that those writers of Orange is New Black and other shows with white people who write for black characters are getting all of their material from black Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr. She didn't say YouTube, but I imagine, you know, we out here. And mostly from black women and femmes. We are the ones writing the dialogue and giving backstories to characters. They silently observe and in, then turn around and incorporate the language of the oppressed into their script. But as usual, they will never credit the source. Once again, our labor goes unappreciated and unrewarded while white people sit back and collect checks off our black girl. That was so aptly and suckingly said. And we still need to know what happened to Miss Claudette. It's season four, girl. Where's she been? Okay, comment down below, thumbs up. Smart Brown Girl, do sense. Do you want to see more Smart Brown Girl content like this? Support by becoming a Smart Brown Girl patron today or checking out any of the Smart Brown Girl merchandise that's listed in the description box below.